Thank you, Daryl. John, can I welcome you up? We'll pray for John. <laughs> Moving his plexiglass. Who would have ever thought? Yeah. Yeah. So, Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for John and his family. And uh, we pray your protection upon them, uh, especially during this time when he's very busy uh, prepping and uh, just gathering the good thoughts that you place in his mind to present them to us. Thank you, Jesus, that you love us and that your word is shining here. I pray that uh, you will be with us as we listen to John with open hearts and open minds. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thanks, Craig. We're decidedly weighted toward this side of the room. So if I'm talking in circles, it's that balance issue, um, and it's your fault. Good morning and welcome here. Please open your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 11. A man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. This is the Mary who later poured the expensive perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was sick, so the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. When Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God, so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. So although Jesus loved Mary, sorry, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he sta stayed where he was for the next two days. Finally, he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. But his disciples objected. Rabbi, they said, it's only a, only a few days ago, the people in Judea were trying to stone you. Are you going there again? Jesus replied, there are 12 hours of daylight every day. During the day, people can walk safely. They can see because they have the light of this world. But at night, there is danger of stumbling because they have no, no light. Then he said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. But now I will go wake him up. The disciples said, Lord, if he's sleeping, he'll soon get better. They thought Jesus meant Lazarus was simply sleeping, but Jesus meant that Lazarus had died. So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there. For now you will really believe. Come, let's go see him. Thomas, nicknamed the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let's go too and die with Jesus. When Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in the grave for four days. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem, and many of the people had come to console Martha and Mary in their loss. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming out, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. This is the word of the Lord. Today we're going to talk about the problem of evil and suffering. And to put this problem as simply as possible, it goes like this. If God is loving and God is powerful, why is there evil? To put it in a more personal context, we ask the question, why does life have to hurt so much? If God is really on his throne, if God really cares for us, why is this happening? We've been in this ser sermon series talking about the questions and objections people have about the Christian faith, and there was no way that we were going to get through this series without talking about this, because this is a very important issue. It's something all of us will ask. Suffering affects every single one of us. It doesn't matter how fit you are, how healthy you are, how wealthy you are, where you live, or whether you're young or old. None of us get through life without being touched by it. And there are two sides, two aspects to this problem, right? There's moral evil, which is evil that is caused because of people's decisions, right? This last week, we celebrated Remembrance Day. 102 years ago, on Wednesday, the guns of the Great, Great War finally went silent after taking the lives of 20 million people and driving millions more from their homes. That is an example of moral evil, but there's also natural evil, right? There's evil that is not directly connected to any of our choices. 102 years ago, just as the Great War was ending, the Spanish flu was beginning. And if you think that the Spanish flu is in any way comparable to coronavirus, you are 
very mistaken, right? Right now, British Columbia has lost about 300 people. Spanish flu killed 10% of the world population. And it didn't kill the elderly. It didn't kill those immune compromised. It killed people in the prime of life who were healthy, who were the breadwinners and the caregivers for their families. So not only did one-tenth of the world die, those who were left behind were often left destitute. That is an example of, moral, or of natural evil. Now, sometimes the two are mixed, right? We see other natural disasters like forest fires and famines, and it's this combination of human mismanagement and natural phenomena. But we do see that there are both of these issues that we wrestle with, and it may, both of them will make us ask the question, how could God allow this to happen? Why wouldn't God stop it. Why wouldn't he step in to do something? And when these kinds of things happen, our hearts are in the same place as Mary, right? Or Martha. Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not be dead. So I want us to be realistic about what is going to happen in the next half an hour or so. This problem demands a thoughtful response, and so I want us to think deeply about this, and yet we need to be very careful here. It's very easy to give a pat answer. It's very easy to give a heretical answer, and there aren't any easy answers. And if I may, I want to begin a little bit backwards of what I would normally do. I want to begin with some practical application here. And that is that when someone in our life is hurting, when evil and suffering uh, happen to someone, it, it often does more harm than good to immediately lay on them our best guesses as to an explanation or an interpretation or even an encouragement. Um, the reality is, is that words cannot change facts. They can change how we see facts, but they cannot change the raw facts that evil has happened in someone's life. But there is something we can do. We can be present with someone in their pain and in their hurt. We can't take away their pain, but at the same time, when you are hurting the feeling of being alone in it is this amplifier to pain that makes everything worse, and that is something we can, that is a need that we can meet by simply sitting with someone, weeping with them, praying with them, crying out to God with them. That's a gift that we can all give. We know that Romans 8.28 says that God works all things together for the purpose of, or for the good of those who love him and are called to his purpose. And it's very tempting for us to reach for that, and yet that may not be the right thing to answer or to give someone in the moment. As one author, Dane Ortland, writes, that Romans 8.28 comes before Romans 12.15 in the canon doesn't mean that it should in our counseling in friendships. And what does Romans 12.15 say? Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Six years ago, I was just packing up my house to move here to Whistler, and my sister gave me a call. Um, Her marriage ended that day. She was on her own now with three kids who were six, four, and one year old at the time. Uh, She had built a life down in the Bay Area near San Francisco, for the last 10 years, and now she was going to leave all that behind, move back to Canada and just survive. She said to me, what's the lesson I'm supposed to learn here, right? What is the the character that God is supposed to build in me? Because right now I don't see it, and I just really want to know. And I think what she desperately wanted in that moment was to just be able to tick the box and say, yes, Lord, I learned the lesson. Now can I have my life back? Now can the pain go away? But that's not how it works, is it? I don't know exactly what I said. Um, being a, a theology student, you know, I, I certainly could have given her a philosophical and theological treatise 
uh, systematically going through explanations of the nature of evil and suffering, but the Holy Spirit knew, knew better, and he shut me up for a good long while. <laughs> and so finally, when I did speak, I said, I, I'm just sorry. This sucks. And, you know, I'm, I, I don't feel like I am at all qualified to speculate on what good will come of this or what God will form in you. But for right now, one thing I do know is that the world is broken. It's not supposed to be like this. It's cursed. And until Jesus comes back, every single one of us are going to get hurt in our own way. So this brings me to the first point I want to make about suffering that we, we see in Scripture. And that is that it exists. And that it is a problem for everybody. Genesis 3 talks about the sin of Adam and Eve and how there was this break in the relationship between God and humanity and that break has consequences for every other relationship we have. It has consequences for our relationship with nature, right? We have to work in order to survive. We have to toil. We have to strive. Our relationship with nature becomes one of marked by fear, struggle for survival, Our relationships with one another, even in family, even in marriage, become marked by conflict and this battle for control. Our relationship with our own selves now becomes marked with shame and guilt. Our relationship with our body becomes marked by sickness and death. And from the whole Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, there is this acknowledgement that it shouldn't be like this way Suffering and evil are never dismissed. They are presented as very real and very much a problem that needs to be solved. Now, one of the problems that people create for themselves is that when they encounter suffering, when they encounter evil, they have this tendency to respond by denying that God exists, right? If God is Loving, if God is powerful and suffering exists, God must not exist. And for Charles Darwin, this is it, right? Now, Charles Darwin, you need to know, when he began his career as a naturalist, he was a believer. He went out to discover the goodness of God's creation. It was a means of worship. It was something that captivated him. Then something happened. His daughter died. She was about the same age as my own daughter. And that changed how he saw nature. He he, he no longer looked at nature and saw the beauty and goodness of God's creation. What he saw was meaningless, purposelessness, directionless cruelty. In his diary, he wrote one day about a particular parasitic wasp uh, and this wasp's life cycle depended on the wasp implanting its eggs in the body of another creature and then once those larvae hatched they would eat that creature from the inside out and this is what he wrote he said i cannot persuade myself that a beneficent and omnipotent god would have designedly created the ichmonidae parasitic wasp with the express intention of feeding within the living bodies of caterpillars Or that cats should play with mice, for that matter. If you read any other leading atheist today, they will point to suffering. This is the issue, the number one argument for why they believe that a belief in God is irrational. Sam Harris, Daniel Dennett, Richard Dawkins, all of them point to the existence of cruelty and suffering in the world to say that God does not exist. All there is is nature. Are we all, all we are is the stardust that we are made of. The problem is, if you say that suffering and evil disprove the existence of God, then you are faced with the problem that if God does not exist, you have no category to talk about suffering and evil. It doesn't make sense. Listen to what Richard Dawkins says about, the, about suffering in the universe. He says, The total amount of suffering per year in the natural world is beyond all decent contemplation. 
During the minute that it takes me to compose this sentence, thousands of animals are being eaten alive. Many others are running for their lives, whimpering with fear. Others are slowly being devoured from within by rasping parasites. Thousands of all kinds are dying of starvation, thirst, and disease. It must be so. If ever there is a time of plenty, the very fact will automatically lead to an increase in population until the natural state of starvation and misery is restored. In a universe of electrons and selfish genes, blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt. Other people are going to get lucky and you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, nor any justice. The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect, if there is. Now listen to this. At bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. So, in the world of Richard Dawkins, why is it tragic for a child to die. Why, what makes a living body better than a dead one? What makes a happy person better than someone who is being tortured to death? On what basis do we consider someone's actions to be cruel and another's to be good? All we are doing is dancing to our DNA. We are all just doing as nature has directed us. There is no goal. There's no good for us to aspire to. There's no evil for us to avoid. The only value we have is what we create for ourselves. The only justice there is is what we create for ourselves. And that sounds very attractive to a lot of people, right? Get to make your own rules. But there's a catch, right? If we all get to make our own rules... How do we appeal to any higher form of justice when someone else's rules result in pain and suffering for us? Martin Luther King, at the height of the civil rights movement, was thrown in the Birmingham jail down in Alabama, and he wrote a letter from there in which he talked about the nature of justice, and he said, human laws cannot be the measure of justice in themselves. They cannot be the highest law. Because there is such a thing as an unjust law. The Holocaust happened because unjust laws were created. But the only way that we can say that a law is just or unjust is if there is a higher law by which we measure it. And that law comes from God. Without God as the ultimate measure of justice, why should one person's standard of justice be privileged over another? As the Russian author uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky put it, if God does not exist, everything is permitted. Rape, murder, slavery, genocide. The strong will do whatever they want. The weak will suffer what they must. See, it doesn't help anything to reject belief in God. You are still left with an existence full of suffering, but no way to explain it. Certainly no reason to have hope. Second, suffering isn't meaningless. So after the 2011 tsunami happened in Japan and so many homes were destroyed and so many people were hurt and killed. Um, author Sam Harris offered these words of comfort to the world. He said, either God can do nothing to stop catastrophes like this, or he doesn't care to, or he doesn't exist. God is either impotent, evil, or imaginary. Take your pick and choose wisely. So what's wrong with his argumentation here? What Sam Harris doesn't acknowledge is that sometimes there are good reasons for suffering. That a greater good is created through, the, through suffering. You know, for my kids, uh, there's a lot of how I parent them that they don't fully comprehend, right? Now, I can, in theory, keep them from hurting 
themselves and one another. I, I can do that in theory, um, but what that would require is for each of them to be in solitary confinement, wrapped in bubble wrap in a padded room. I don't do that. I allow them to be in circumstances where they will learn, and they will learn the hard way sometimes. This morning, I got to watch as one son drove over the other son with the stroller at the back of the gym. And could I have prevented that? Yes, but what doesn't kill them makes them stronger, right? See, loving them well means giving them the freedom to experience life and to grow and mature and develop. Restricting, keeping that from ever happening is what uh, preventing all suffering would do for them. Freedom is itself a positive good. And I know that many of you are feeling like right now with the present health situation in our world that the, 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 the disease can't possibly be worse than the cure that we're experiencing right now. I think that we, we are all feeling the value of our freedom. Um, let me read you a quote from C.S. Lewis. He writes, God created things which had free will. That means creatures which can do, go wrong or they can go right. Some people think they can imagine a creature which was free but had no possibility of going wrong. But I can't. If a thing is free, it has to be good. Uh, sorry, if a thing is free to be good, it's also free to be bad. And free will is what has made evil possible. Why then did God give them free will? Because free will, though it makes evil possible, is also the only thing that can make possible any love or goodness or joy worth having. A world of automata, of creatures that work like machines, could hardly be worth creating. The happiness which God designs for his higher creatures is the happiness of being freely, voluntarily united with him and to each other in an ecstasy of love and delight, compared with which the most rapturous love between a man and a woman on this earth is mere milk and water. And for that, we've got to be free. Now, the beautiful thing is that God doesn't just give us the freedom so that, that we can go out and destroy ourselves. He doesn't abandon us to that freedom. He is working in history. He's working in our lives. He is sovereignly uh, working everything together for good. Evil people, and even the devil himself, we, they will make real moral choices for which they are morally responsible. And yet, at the end of the day, God's good purposes will be accomplished. His will will be done. And this is one of the biggest mysteries that our minds try to wrap our minds around, and yet we see how this plays out in Scripture in so many different ways. You think of the life of Joseph, right? Here Joseph is, he's kind of the, the spoiled kid. His brothers hate him. They decide they're going to kill him. And at the last minute, they realize that they can make more money. They can actually make some money if they just throw him into slavery, sell him into slavery instead. So that's what they do. He goes off as a slave to Egypt. He starts working in a house of, of a very wealthy family. But the, uh, the wife of his owner uh, makes several unwanted sexual advances towards him. He rejects her. He's accused of rape and thrown, of attempted rape thrown into prison, okay? In prison, he makes some friends. Finally, things start to, to look up. One of them's going to get out, and he's going to help him out, but then he forgets. And, you, and I know that many of you know how this story ends, but I just want you to just imagine for a second that you don't know how this ends. How would, forget that his name is Joseph. Take these facts. A guy is a a convicted sex offender in jail, how do you think things are going to play for him, out for him? What good is going to come of this? Even if you told this guy, hey, guess what? Things are going to turn out really good for you. Would he believe you? No. It is not within his frame of reference to even understand that. And yet, we go forward to Genesis 50. And now, Joseph is the prime minister of Egypt. Everything that happened to him in his life has been bringing him to this moment. His brothers have come. They are starving. They're facing famine in their land. They are desperate to just survive. 
and they realize that the one who holds power of life and death for them is the guy they wanted to kill and sold, they, they sold into slavery. Now, there's this beautiful moment of forgiveness and reconciliation. And we hear from Joseph how he has come to understand the circumstances of his life. So his brothers have fallen at his feet begging for forgiveness and Joseph with tears in his eyes says this, don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so that I can save the lives of many people. So he's not denying that his brothers did a wrong thing or that they are morally responsible. He's saying that all along, God had a plan. And this plan is good. And he sees that now. And this happens over and over and over again in Scripture. A mother desperately tries to save her son by putting him, this little baby boy, into a basket and pushing it out into the river because even though his chances of surviving that might be slim, if she keeps him in her home, his chances are none. And that basket floats down to the home of the princess of Egypt. And he's adopted into that family, right? Look at the life of Daniel, who as a little boy sees his home, his city, his nation destroyed, much of his family murdered. He's carried off into exile, but there in exile, God uses him to save the lives of many people of his nation. Same thing with Esther. That's her story too, right? When we talk about God's sovereignty over history and we talk about human responsibility, sometimes it is very hard for us to see how these two can possibly fit together. And yet the Bible takes both very seriously and says they do both fit together. Right? You look at the question of who killed Jesus. Well, we can say in the most immediate physical sense, the Roman soldiers killed Jesus. Now, they would say they were only following orders. Is that a legit excuse? No. But that does mean that there is responsible for, responsibility for those who gave them the orders. Now, Pontius Pilate, he said he washed his hands of the situation and he is not responsible. But the reality is washing your hands of the situation doesn't change anything. He is responsible he was the one who signed his death warrant. Okay, what about the crowds, right? They actually accepted responsibility for Jesus' death. They said, his blood be upon our heads. Are they the only ones who are responsible? No. What about Satan? Is Satan responsible? When Jesus was arrested, he said, your hour has come. Now is the hour when darkness reigns. So yeah, he's responsible. But what about God? Is God responsible for the death of Jesus? Some people want to say, no, no, no. Everything bad that happens that's outside of God's control, it's not his problem. He's working to change it, but he's not responsible. But I don't think we're going to get God off the hook. I want to read for you a prophecy written about the Messiah, about Jesus, 700 years before he was born. This is Isaiah 53. It says about Jesus, He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep silent before the shearers. He did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream. He was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone. He was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. But listen to this. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him 
cause him grief. See, in this passage, we have both the unjust actions of human beings and the good and just purposes of God coming together. And I think about my own life, there are so many instances where I can look back at things that went wrong and ways that I was wronged that I feel like I can definitely thank God for. Thank God for the jobs I didn't get. I thank God for all the girls that didn't want to date me. I, you know, I mean, they could have been kinder about rejecting me, but, you know, the times of financial stress, of relational stress, of uncertainty that have just turned out better than I could have asked or imagined. And I recognize that the grief and the disappointment and the pain were as necessary to bring me to a place of being blessed and growing and maturing every bit as much as the good times and the times I am very easily thankful for. That said, there are things in my life that I, I just don't, I can't wrap my mind around. I, I can't see how they would lead for good. There are circumstances I see in the lives of people around me where I, I don't have the slightest clue what good is going to come out of it. I don't have the slightest clue what clue what good could possibly come out of it. I don't think it's presumptuous for me to say that probably a lot of people feel that way. A lot of people ask that question. So what do we do when we don't see how it's all going to play out? We don't see how it could possibly all play out for our good. Well, this is where the challenge of walking by faith comes in. Now, again, I want to be super cautious because to simply just say have faith is a, is a pat answer. It's not good enough. But what does it genuinely mean to walk by faith? John Stackhouse writes, The real problem is keeping faith in God. Theoretically, God could give us full knowledge of all of God's doings, and we wouldn't have to have faith. We would just see, understand, and approve of God's providence. It seems extremely doubtful, however, that we as human beings have the intellectual capacity to take in God's global providence over millennia, plus the moral capacity to make correct judgments. To believe in general terms that the world is not as it should be is not the same as having justified confidence in our ability to determine exactly how the greatest good would be produced in any given situation. Right? We might be able to say the world shouldn't be this way, but that doesn't mean we know how it should be. Nonetheless, God cannot simply demand that we trust what God is doing. Faith doesn't work that way. We need knowledge to ground faith, to keep trusting in God's goodness and power in the face of teeming evil of the world requires a lot of knowledge, right? And he's absolutely right. Real faith is not believing something is true in the absence of evidence. Real faith is this relational trust we have. When we don't see how things are going to play out, then we look to the person who's in control and we say, okay, I may not understand this situation, but I, I know you. Some of you might remember about a year ago, my son was walking around with bandages on his face. He had had stitches. He fell, split his chin open, and then he had to have those stitches. So he's on the operating table. They've got him wrapped up in a blanket like a burrito. And he has to hold still, which for three-year-olds, eh, it's not an easy thing for him to do, especially because he doesn't understand what's going on. He doesn't understand those blindingly bright lights over his face. He doesn't understand the doctors with their masks and their loops and all kinds of stuff. He doesn't understand the disgusting feeling of the anesthetic. And then there's the needle and the blood. He 
has no frame of reference to see any of that as being a good thing. Every instinct in his body says, that is harm. I don't want that. I have to get out of here. Everything is telling him to squiggle and worm, squirm and scream his way out of it. Except for one thing. One piece of information. That he sees his daddy's eyes right in front of him. And what his daddy's eyes are communicating to him is, be brave, be still. He has nothing else to go on except that. See, you and I are not always going to make sense of what's going on in our lives when it hurts. We're not going to be able to make sense of things that have happened in history like the Holocaust and be able to say, well, I guess it turned out for good in this way. Ain't going to happen and it's probably a bit insulting to even try. But in Jesus, the character and trustworthiness and love and goodness of God is known to us. God shows us his face, if you will, that we can focus on when we don't see how it's all going to go. He meets with us in our suffering. And what we have to see in the midst of that suffering is that relief isn't always our greatest good, right? It's not always the thing that is best for us to not hurt. It might feel that way. But the worst thing that can ever happen to us, the, the worst thing that can happen to any human being is to go through our existence and eternity without God. And to meet God in the midst of our suffering, to draw near to him, to be comforted by him, to discover that we can trust him is truly better than to have never suffered at all. When Martha runs up to Jesus with tears in her eyes and she says, Lord, my brother would still be alive if you would have been here. What does Jesus say? What does he do? He's going to heal Lazarus. We know that. He knows that. She doesn't know that yet. He's not in a rush to do that. What is his priority right now? It's for her to know who he really is. So he replies to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Do you believe this, Martha? See, she sees only the situation, but he invites her to see him for who he really is and find what she truly needs in him. I'll close with a quote about this passage from author Rebecca McLaughlin. She writes, why if Jesus planned to heal Lazarus, did he not do so in the first place? Why did he let Lazarus die and leave Mary and Martha in mourning for days? Why not tell Martha what he was planning to do right away? In this strange stretching of the story, we get a glimpse of the whole biblical framework of suffering. The space between Lazarus' death and Jesus' calling him out of the tomb is a space in which Martha sees Jesus for who he really is. Her very life. This story illuminates both suffering and prayer. We often see prayer as a means to an end. God is a cosmic vending machine. Insert prayer and expect results to drop into your hand or kick the machine in anger when they don't. But the story of Lazarus upends this idea. Jesus is not a means to an end. A mechanism through which Martha can change her circumstances. He is the end. Her circumstances drive her to him. It's not that her suffering or our suffering doesn't matter. It's enough to bring tears to the eyes of the Son of God. But it matters like a first meeting matters to a marriage. Or like a birth matters to motherhood. It's an entry point to a relationship. 
a relationship formed through suffering as much as through joy. If, as Jesus claims, the goal of our existence is a relationship with him, finding him in our suffering is the point. Let's pray. Father, we we live in a very broken world. And I know that all of us have been touched by that brokenness in some way. And for some of us right now, that, that hurt is very present, very, very real. But Father, I thank you that we know that you are not indifferent to our suffering. We know that the evil in this world and the, the, the pain in this world is not bigger than your power. But I pray, Lord, that you would meet with us in our hurt, in our fear, in our anxiety, that you would, by your Holy Spirit, bring us comfort and peace and build that trust in you. That is itself better than a life of comfort where we would have never known pain. Give us the courage to receive our circumstances as the gift they are, even though they may not feel that way. Help us to fix our eyes on you and your goodness and your character when the world seems like it's falling apart. Give us such confidence in your plans that we can honestly pray, not my will, but yours be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Craig, would you read us the benediction?